Good morning, Silver Creek, and once again, welcome to Church Online. We are so glad that you are in church today. And I don't know about you, but I am grateful that summer is finally here. We hope and we pray that you've been able to enjoy the beautiful weather that we've had so far. If your house is anything like our house, I know that someplace in either the kitchen or in the garage, there is a pile of pop cans that is filled to overflowing and you have nowhere that you can take them. In the past, the students of Switch Youth have collected pop cans to raise money for Speed the Light. Speed the Light is an organization that provides essential equipment to missionaries all around the world so they can share the gospel wherever they are. For the next two weeks on Monday and Tuesday afternoons from 12 to 4 p.m., you can drop off those pop cans here at the church to support the fundraising efforts of our students. We ask that when you drop them off, they are sorted out by either pop cans or bottles so that we can keep them separate as we collect them. Thank you for your support of our students uh, and their fundraising efforts for Speed the Light during this time. Don't forget about this week's Feeding America mobile food distribution event on Thursday, June 11th from 3 to 6 p.m. right here at the church. For this week's event, we will have the opportunity to bless at least 200 families in our community with food. We are still in need of a number of volunteers to make the event happen. And if you are interested in serving, you can visit silvercreekchurch.org slash serve to let us know, or you can call the church office this week. This is such an amazing event to be a part of, and we are so excited to once again bless our community through the gift of food. It's hard to believe it, but we have not been together as a church family for the past 12 Sundays. During that time, we want you to know that the only way that Silver Creek Church has continued to be able to function is through the generosity of those who give. If you've never given before, we'd like to encourage you to give. You can go to our website at silvercreekchurch.org slash give, or you can text any dollar amount to the number on your screen. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving to the Lord. In just a moment, we will have the opportunity to worship together once again. And as we normally do, we encourage you to shut out distractions during this time and allow yourself to participate in worship. Even though you're not standing next to someone else from Silver Creek, we are worshiping together from all over the place. We are so glad that you are in church this morning here at Silver Creek Church.
is moving here in front of me, moving here in front of me. The one who made the deaf to hear is silencing my every fear, silencing my every fear. I believe in you. the God of miracles. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of Reaching out to me, reaching out. 
Father, we, we understand that the last week and a half here in this nation has been chaotic, tumultuous. And Father, the song that, that we have just sung and, and worshiped together with declares, it is well with my soul. Lord, in that original song, the author was referring to losing his wife and, or his children rather, in a shipwreck at sea. And when Horatio Spafford crossed the Atlantic and arrived approximately in that place, that area where the ship had gone down, he penned those words, it is well with my soul. He wasn't writing them from a, a time of, of great joy in his life. He wasn't writing them from a time of great accomplishment in his life. He was writing them from the lowest moment that he had ever experienced in his life. And Father, there are some of us here that feel like we are at low moments in life. Lord, we've, we've lifted up your name, we've praised you, we've declared in faith it is well with my soul. But yet the feelings that we have inside really don't line up with what our words are speaking. And Father, I pray that that, Lord, you would just minister right now. Lord, to those that are, are having moments where they think, how, how much more difficult can it get? Father, some of those are, are family-related. Some of those might be health-related. Some, it might be financially Related Others, it may be stress and anxiety related. But to sing and to worship to that song, It is well with my soul, gives us a sense of, of almost that we're, we're being duplicitous, that we're being two-faced because we're saying it is well with my soul, and yet what is happening on the inside of us doesn't feel like it's well with my soul. And so, Father, I pray, that by the power of your Holy Spirit right now, Lord, that you would begin to move in the hearts and lives of those who are struggling with that feeling. And Father, I pray that in faith, in, as even a prophetic statement, we would say it is is well even though the circumstances don't don't look that way we would declare it is well with my soul father i thank you for your grace i thank you for your peace that you have made available to us and i pray pour it out today in jesus name amen well good morning we want to welcome you to our online service here at Silver Creek Church. My name is Kevin Taylor. I'm the lead pastor at Silver Creek. It's great to be with you today. And we're starting a new series in the month of June called Love Does. And I stole that series title from author Bob Goff, who used it for a book titled Love Does. And I'm not taking the message from the book, but I love the title and I'm going to steal that message. And over the course of the next month, we are going to look at four passages of scripture that will help us to understand what love Love does. And today, the passage that I'd like us to start with is found in Romans chapter 13, beginning at verse 8. Paul says this, Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. 
the commands, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commands there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understand the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because your salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Today what I'd like us to do is to look at these verses in Romans chapter 13 because I believe they're going to show us four things that love does. And the first one is this. We need to live debt-free. Love lives debt-free. That first verse that we read there in Romans chapter 13, the first part of verse 8, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. There's a, a guy that we hear often on the radio, uh, and some of you have even probably taken his course. His name is Dave Ramsey, and, and Dave Ramsey talks about debt-free living. Um, he's got a really neat program called Financial Freedom, um, and it's a really uh, an, an interesting program, and a lot of people have really benefited from it, and he tells people how they can become debt-free, and when they become debt-free, he has them sometimes come and visit his headquarters and they do something called the debt-free scream. And literally at the end of their interview on the radio, he will have the, the individual or the husband and wife, they will scream loudly the words, I, I, I'm free or I'm debt free or freedom. In fact, he, he even uses um, a, a line from a movie where a character yells freedom. He puts that even in the background of their debt scream. And that scream comes because the weight has been lifted. The weight of, of, of owing creditors has been lifted from their hearts and, and their minds. Well, I want you to notice the word that Paul puts in here in, in Romans chapter 13. It's the word accept. He uses the word debt once, and then he uses the word debt again, but he puts the word accept in between those two things. And what Paul is, is really saying is that after, after we've paid off the credit cards, after we've paid off the car payment, after we've paid for, for our college uh, loans, after we've paid for the kids' braces, after we've paid for, for the camper or, or the boat, after we've paid all of those things off, he uses that word accept. And he says that after you've done all of that, that you still owe a debt. And the word owe in the Greek, it means to be morally obligated to pay. Ellicott's commentary really makes the connection to the word dues. Now, my dad, I've told you this before, my dad worked for General Motors for 42 years. And last month, my dad celebrated his 20th year in retirement, and I'm really happy for my dad and love having him around. But think about that for just a moment. Working for 42 years and 20 years of retirement, and you're a part of a union, the UAW Local 95 my dad was a part of, and so for 62 years, Every time he gets a paycheck, every time he gets a payment from his pension, they take out union dues. And, and literally, that, that payment, it never gets paid off. As long as a payment goes out, a payment gets made for dues. And you can never get it paid off. And Paul is saying, that the debt that we owe literally can never be paid off. 
I want to take it now from the financial kind of example and let's move it over to the, the relational side of the equation just for a moment. And let me use as an illustration um, the AA 12 step program. Steps eight and nine in the AA program tell us that, that we need to make a list of everyone who has been harmed in our lives. And then we need to be willing to make amends, and then we need to make direct amends. And so this, this idea is that, that even when we have paid off all of that debt, even when we have, have, um, we have, have made amends to everyone in our life that we possibly can, when we've done everything that we can, that we still owe a debt, we are still morally obligated to love those in our lives. Whether it's our spouse, whether it's our kids, whether it's our parents, whether it's our boss or our employee, whether it's our fellow uh, workers, whether it's a neighbor, whether uh, it's anyone else that comes across our path, we can never pay off that debt. And, and it will continue to be something that we owe Love, love, I want you to think about that. Love, it, it's, it's got to live debt free. We've got to continue to pay that which we owe that debt of love. Number two, we need to obey the law. Love obeys the law. Look at verses eight again, the second half of verse eight and then verse nine. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. On the past few weeks, I've told you about some of my experiences on Grove Street, and I want you to know that the saga continues. And, and I just want to share just a, a, a brief story about that. The other day, um, I was coming home after um, being here at the office all day, and, and I, I came through the roundabout there on 41 at 7th Street and Grove Street and, and come through there onto 41, keeping my speed, you know, um, as it should be, you know, in that, that 25-ish miles per hour. And I'm coming up the hill on Grove Street there, and I'll, I look in my rearview mirror, and I notice a dark vehicle behind me and he's gaining he's gaining speed he's getting closer and i can tell that this is a a law enforcement vehicle and um and so i <laughs> Immediately, my hands are at 10 and 2 again, as I've said before, and I'm looking in my rearview mirror, and I'm thinking to myself everything that I need to say, and I'm thinking about the, the, the taillight that I'm having difficulty with, and I'm changing out the bulb, and I'm, I'm fixing the wiring, and, and it just... It, Whatever I do, it doesn't seem to, to be helping, and I, it keeps going out on me, and I'm thinking about, okay, I need to, I need to know that, and, and, and I'm thinking about the things that I need to say as that officer is preparing to pull me over, and I'm looking through my rearview mirror, and as we get up to the stoplight on McClellan, I notice that he starts to move toward the left lane. And he pulls right up alongside me, and he's really close to me. And I'm looking straight ahead. I, I'm just trying to act like I'm, I'm the perfect driver. And then I can tell that he lowers his passenger side window. So I turn my head, and I, and I, I roll my window down. And honestly, this is what he said to me. Hey, pastor. Do you know that your left tail light is out? And I got to tell you, there is more to obeying the law than just doing 25 on Grove Street. And as we look at what Paul talks about in Romans 13, he alludes to the Ten Commandments found in the book of Exodus chapter 20. 
Now, throughout Jesus' ministry, many times he was tested, he was quizzed, he was challenged by the religious factions of his day. And in one particular occasion, what they asked him was, Teacher, what is the greatest command? And automatically, our minds would go to the Ten Commandments given by God to Moses. But that is not what Jesus did. Instead, Jesus goes to what a, a scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 6, known as the Shema. It was a daily prayer that Jews would pray that started with the words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. And in that prayer, you would declare... That, we, that you are to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And Jesus added the word and. And we read about it in Matthew 22, verses 39 and 40, where he says, and the second is like it. So Jesus said, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he goes on to verse 40, all, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. So when you boil it down, when you boil everything down in the Mosaic law, and there are 613 laws contained in the Old Testament. It was extremely complicated, but when you boil it all down in the Mosaic Law, love God and love your neighbor is the fulfillment of the law. And to the Jew, the law was preeminent. There was nothing that was above the law. In fact, failure to obey the law in many instances would result in capital punishment. It was extremely serious. And what Jesus is telling us is that when we love God and we love our neighbor, we are fulfilling the entire revelation of God's divine plan and will for our lives. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 14 says it this way, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So when we love God, with our heart, mind, and soul, and when we love our neighbor as ourself, we are fulfilling all of God's laws. Remember that Jesus even said, if you love me, keep my commandments. The third thing that we see here in Romans chapter 8 that love does is love does no harm. Let's look at verse 10. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. I've got a friend. His name is Phil. And Phil and I worked together in Pennsylvania for several years. And Phil was a track star through college. And he ran for the Oregon Ducks, and Phil was a hurdler. And he had some great accomplishments during his career there at Oregon. And one of the things that, that he wanted to do, he set a goal for himself. And in 1979, his goal was to make the finals for the NCAA track finals, the finals in the 110-meter hurdles. Now, I want to give you some context, okay? Okay. But the, the men's hurdles in the 110-meter hurdles, the, 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 the height of the hurdle was 42 inches, okay? So somewhere on my body, okay, 42 inches is going to give you an idea because I'm about 64 and a half inches tall. 42 inches is somewhere up in this area in my body. And they would have to go over 
10 hurdles, and his goal was to make it to the finals. There were only eight runners uh, in, in the entire uh, track meet that could make it to the finals, one of them being a man named Ronaldo Nehemiah, who was the world record holder and was the, the odds-on favorite to win the gold medal in 1980, except for the fact that the U.S. wound up pulling out of those Olympics. And in the finals, Phil came in sixth. He made it to the finals. He accomplished his goal. He was sixth. And I noticed as I was looking at the records that one of uh, the runners, particularly it was the runner uh, from UCLA, beside his name was uh, initials DNF, and that stands for did not finish. And so I had to ask Phil, I said, Phil, what happened to the runner from UCLA? And Phil said that because there was a, a little bit of a tailwind that day, and the steps that you take in between uh, the hurdles, the wind pushes you closer as you go over that first hurdle, and then you're a little bit closer. And so those three steps that you take, your third step becomes shorter and shorter and shorter, and the runner from UCLA, by the sixth hurdle, could not even attempt to jump the hurdle, and so he pulled up and didn't finish the race. Well, the absolute minimum for finishing that race is to stay in your lane and to clear all 10 of those hurdles. What Paul is telling us is that the bare minimum of love is to do no harm. And right now, here in America, that is being trampled on every day. We see, we see people like George Floyd who have lost their life so unfairly. We see the, the protests that have turned violent. We see the destruction. We see the harm that is being done, not just to property, but even to human life. And I see in America there is this strong cry for justice. And people are, they're saying, where is the justice in all of this? And, and some might even be wondering, where is God in all of this? And I want you to know, friends, that God is faithful and God is just. Psalm 33 says that God loves justice. We read in the Old Testament book of Zechariah, chapter 7 and verse 9, this is what the Lord Almighty says, administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. I think it's common for us to want to hold someone responsible for the actions of those that we see every night on television in the reporting. I just want to encourage you, be praying for those that you see. Be praying for those who are being given the task to stand there and uphold the law. Pray for those uh, that are even um, trying to keep the peace. Pray for those who are trying to get a message across. But we see that there is, there, there is a lot of harm that's being done. And to bring justice about in our country starts with do no harm. And it starts with us. It starts with me and it starts with you. I want to take it a step further. You see, our world is filled with injustice. And it's really, it's really not good for us just to focus on one. Think about this, that every day, just in our country, there are thousands upon thousands who go to bed each night hungry. They don't know where their next meal is coming from. They don't know what the source of their food is going to be. Every day in our country, there are countless women and children who are abused. They're abused verbally. They're abused physically. 
Some are abused sexually. There are even women and children that are sold into slavery. I want you to think for a moment that every day in this country, there are 3,000 unborn babies whose lives are taken from them through abortion. We have a lot of injustice that's happening. Maybe the greatest injustice of all is that there are people that live in my neighborhood and in your neighborhood who have never been told that Jesus died for them. And they are in danger of dying and going to hell. And we've never told them that Jesus loves them and that he died for them. Where is the cry for injustice for these? What's happening in Minneapolis, New York, Philadelphia, Las Vegas, that's a flashpoint. And what happened to George Floyd is a flashpoint that it's opened our eyes for a moment to see the harm that's been done to people. But how long will that last? How long will our eyes stay open? And what sort of impact will that ultimately make? The starting minimum to cross the bar to love is to do no harm. And number four, Paul says we need to understand the time. Look at verse number 11 there in Romans 13. He says, and do this, understand the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because your salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. What he's saying here is we need to remember the time. We need to appreciate the time. You see, friends, it's time for you and I as believers, as followers of Christ, it's time for us to wake up from our spiritual sleep. We need to shake off the lethargy that we have had that has kept us from loving people the way that we should love people. And the reason is because Jesus is going to return as he has promised. He said, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I am going to come back so that I can take you to be with me. We read in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, it says they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. This is the disciples. They're looking up into the sky because Jesus has just been taken away into the clouds. And it says when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Friends, you know the Bible tells us no one knows the day, no one knows the hour of Jesus' return. Not the angels in heaven, not Jesus himself, but only God the Father knows. The Bible says that Jesus will return as a thief in the night. But I do know this, that we are one day closer than we were yesterday to his return. This morning as I close, I want to ask you, have your debts been paid? You see, we still owe a debt of love. Are we paying that debt day after day? Are we, are we paying it to everyone who we come in contact? 
the Greek refers to not just one another, but the other. So whoever the other is that we're with, are we paying that debt of love to them? The dues that we owe that have to be paid that are never fully paid off, are we still paying that debt? debt of love. Even after everyone, we have righted every relationship, we have paid every debt that we have, we continue to owe that debt. Are we paying that debt of love? Are we we keeping God's law? Now, I know we need to keep man's law, but are we keeping God's law? And God's law is a law of love. To love God and love our neighbor as ourself? Are we clearing the bare minimum? Are we doing no harm? And friends, I want to I want to encourage you because sometimes by doing nothing at all, we allow harm to happen. Are we doing no harm? And are we understanding the time? Because the time is short. Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. And I close with the scripture. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Our precious Heavenly Father, over the past 10 days we have witnessed so many things happening in our country that we could not imagine. And our focus has shifted from COVID-19 now to riots that are happening in the streets of our major cities. And Father, we might think that we are separated, that we think that somehow there is no application to us, but I believe that today you are calling out your church. You're calling out your followers to love their neighbor and love does no harm. Father, I pray I pray, Lord, that that we would be prepared every day to pay that debt of love because Jesus paid our debt. And so we owe that debt of love to everyone that we come in contact with. Father, I pray that we would live according to your law of love. And I pray that we would would clear the bare minimum of doing no harm and that we would understand what time it is that Jesus is coming soon and that he's one day closer than he was the day before. Father, I believe that the day of Jesus' return is not a day that moves back and forth and not, not, a, not a day that is just according to some whim, but I believe that Father God has determined a day that this is when my son will return. And though that day will come as a surprise, Father, I believe we're one day closer. And I pray that we would live ready and that we would be a people that love God with our heart, soul, and mind, and that we would love our neighbor as ourself. Father, may we spread your love to this lost and dying world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us this week. We're so glad that you did. And we pray that you will go out and that you will be the body of Christ and love others within our community. We love you. We're praying for you. We hope to be with you very soon. God bless you and have a wonderful day. 
If this was your first time joining us this morning here at Silver Creek, we are so grateful that you have spent time with us this morning in worship. We would love to connect with you and we can do so by having you fill out a digital connect card. You can find that at silvercreekchurch.org slash connect. We just wanna find out more about you and your family and how we can better serve you as a church. Also, if you have any prayer needs, please let us know how we can be praying for you throughout the week. We are so glad that you have joined us in church this morning, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Good morning, Silver Creek, and well, you can't smile at me. <laughs> just wanted to go to just right there. <laughs> Ben's money, uh, that is too loud. Okay, that's loud! You can do. Sorry. Dave, what's the date? From six. And I have a little idea. It's summer now. And if you want to feel this morning like you are truly worshiping at Silver Creek Church, you know what? Get up off your couch, go over to your thermostat, turn it up to about 90 degrees, and in about 10 minutes, you will feel like you are worshiping on a normal Sunday morning at Silver Creek Church.